take that airfield. And so we got up to go across that airfield. And this was at night. And as we going up, we got up on top of that and moving across there, the Navy come through and dropped these flares and just lit that thing up. And boy, the Japs opened up. Well, my buddy was killed. And, and uh, that was my last time that I seen Iwo Jima. Well, I'll tell you the rest of that story later. But at any rate, I want to let you know how the Japanese worked. They would not surrender. It didn't make any difference what you did, what you said, how you had them, where you got them cornered, where you got them in a cave, where you were going to blast them or whatever. They did not quit. They would not surrender. Inside one of the pillboxes, they had a sign. They're courageous battle vows. Number one. Above all, we shall dedicate ourselves and our entire strength in the defense of this island. Number two, we shall infiltrate and in the midst of the enemy and annihilate them. Three, we cannot allow ourselves to be captured. Four, each of your shots must kill many Americans. Five, we shall grasp bombs, charge enemy tanks, and destroy them. Six, each man will make it his duty to kill 10 of the enemy before dying. Seven, until we are destroyed to the last man, we shall harass the enemy with guerrilla tactics. Now that's, that's how they thought. They thought that the Americans would be able to outproduce them with production in the United States. They had that figured out. But they thought to increase the spirit of his men, the general then introduced kamikaze, which is a suicide doctrine. So if you're laying in there at night, they're coming at you, believe me, they're going to keep on coming. So the only thing you can do is kill them or be killed. Well, there was 22,000 Japanese on Iwo Jima, and there were 70,000 Americans. Now, if, if you take 92,000 combatants. There's eight square miles. That's 11,000 combatants per square mile. And it's just as flat as this stage. There's no trees, there's no rocks, there's no nothing. It's just flat, volcanic ash. That's what we had to fight in. But the night that I was hit, uh, they took me off the island. How I got off, I don't know, but I wound up I came to on a hospital ship, a hospital ship to Saipan Army Hospital from there to, to uh, Guam, Guam to Hawaii, Hawaii to Frisco and to the U.S. Naval Hospital in Astoria, Oregon. I was in the hospital and um, the American Legion, of course, visited a lot and so did the VFW and the VA. So I was in there two months and um, I laid in there six months all total, and they were doing operations on my back and my leg and my, taking a shell out of a part of my neck. And um, so one of the VA men says, you know, what are you going to do when you get out of here? I says, well, I'm going to go home, Indianapolis. And he says, well, you, you don't have no education. You don't have nothing. What are you going to do? I don't know. He says, well, while you're laying here, why don't you get your GED? I said, you know, that's a pretty good idea. So I did. So I came home. I had a 100% disability. Came home. So I decided I'm going to go to get a GI Bill. So I go downtown and I fill out all my papers and everything, you know. And he said, well, you know, he said, you should um, take an adaptability test, find out what you're good for. So I did. And he said, you should study law. I said, no, nah, I'm more mechanical. I don't want to be a lawyer. So at any rate, I had a buddy in Chicago, and I called him, and I said, coming up. So we, I went up there, went out to Northwestern, and uh, filled out my papers and all. To make a long story short, I got a degree of mechanical engineering from Northwestern University. I got a degree from Purdue University in nuclear engineering, and uh, a career with General Motors. General Motors then to uh, Bayes Corporation with five subdivisions, and now a national development company 
which we do design, construction, and finance on governmental facilities, no private or industrial type work. So that's what I did. So a little lie has really made me a career. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Mr. Bays, would you get the microphone that's on the pedestal over there? Let me, let me get the, the microphone, please. Well, ladies and gentlemen, three distinct stories. We're pushing the envelope time-wise. Let me ask these three distinguished gentlemen, would you mind if we slipped over a little bit time-wise? Would you, would you allow us to go beyond the window of time that was allowed? Time and a half. Time and a half, OK. <laughs> So we'll take a collection soon to make this work. Uh, but if I uh, could, we have a few questions that we're getting, are we, Peter? I actually have a, uh, I want to continue Donald's story just a little bit. Okay. I, I have to add something to Don, Donald's story about Catigliano and the shave and the haircut. I was uh, very honored to take Donald back to Italy to show him uh, Catigliano, Eola, and his battlefield in Hill 775. Um, the first time, we got to Catigliano, we just didn't know where anything was, and he said, well, I got a shave and the haircut downtown. A really small town, uh, you can't even drive a car in there. And so we just started asking people Donald's age, were you here during the war, what do you remember? And we found a couple that said, oh yes, there was a barber shop downtown next to the town hall, and they gave us the address, so we walked there. And we're taking a picture in front of Donald in front of of the barber shop, what used to be a barber shop, now is a children's clothing store. Well, Donald, what he doesn't tell you about the story is when he was in that farmhouse above town, uh, the family, the farmer's wife made ch chestnut pancakes and chestnut bread and chestnut muffins because they had two chestnut trees, huge chestnut trees outside the front door of the house, but that's all they had to eat. And Donald and his platoon mates traded their sea rations for this home-cooked chestnut bread, chestnut pancakes, and whatnot. So we're taking a picture of Donald in front of what used to be the barber shop, and this older gentleman ambles up. And I said, hey, Lorenzo, our driver, interpreter. Lorenzo, ask him if he was here during the war. He goes, oh, yes, I was here. Uh, and I said, well, what do you remember? He goes, well, I lived in a farmhouse above town, and I remember we had a, a bunch of US soldiers stationed with us. And I remember they gave us their food, and we gave, we, my mom gave them our chestnut bread and chestnut pancakes. And Pietro, as it turns out, was a teenager. Donald was 22, and they were in the, the farmhouse together. And he led us up, so we found the farmhouse. And uh, it's just a fabulous story. Uh, shows you what a small world it is. Let me thank the three of you because we're going to have some questions come up, but I'm going to ask you this question. What is the fondest memory you had upon coming back to the States after being in the theater of war? Wendell? And just pass the microphone down if you would, please. Seeing my mother and father and new wife at the flag stop in Hamden when I got off the train. Thank you. I was on a troop ship, and uh, coming past the Statue of Liberty, the whole mob of soldiers passing that beautiful statue, that was a moment. I recall the parade that was in the city of Indianapolis. It was on the circle, and all of the workers that was in the war plants, the mothers and the fathers, and the grandparents that had really contributed to the armament and the way in which we was able to fight a war. They deserved to be in that parade and they were in that parade and it was really enlightening to see younger people and older people out there in a parade right with the veterans and I, I, that, I was really impressed with that because they we're just as much the winner of that war as we was in, the, in combat. You can fight there, but boy, you can't fight if you don't have something to fight with. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you hold that for a minute? We'll bring it back this way. Yes. So the questions have been offered. 
up and this is for all three of you and there's a couple questions for a couple of you separately. So the first question is, if you could say something about your life to current teen teenagers, what advice would you share with them that you would like to uh, express now? So what advice would you have to the teenagers out there? Well, one of the things that I see is that a lack of discipline in the school system and a lack of respect. And I think that if students are going to really contribute to the great America that we have, that they're going to have to do something for it other than what they seem to be doing now. There is a lot of wonderful, wonderful students, but we've sure got a lot of them that are not contributing in the direction in which I feel they should. Now, I think too that you know, they quit school early. They're marrying Europe and teenage areas. They're marrying very early, creating problems within the family. Parental guidance seems to be lacking in a lot of areas. And I think that something is going to have to change in that direction. And I don't know for sure what it is. Maybe if they don't want to get a job after they get out of high school, maybe put them in the military for two years. That might get a little discipline there. Thank you. Thank you. Donald, do you have any advice for the teenagers? Well, <clears throat> following up on, what, what's your name? I'm sorry, I don't. Jim. Jim. Um, good Lord, my brain is going a little off. I had a, an idea. I, the, one of the problems we have in our society now is that kids are being born without parents. And when back in the days of World War II, it was pretty unusual to have a baby without being married. Today, it's, I don't know what the percentage is, it's an enormous, over 50% of maybe of, of babies born today or without parents. It's really a bad situation. I might add something more just to that. Uh, during uh, the war, uh, the, the people become more affluent. Uh, prior to that, we had a depression. And a lot of the parents were not able to send their kids to school. And they were not able to, to do anything at that point. They themselves perhaps never had a college education. Not that everyone should, but uh, a lot of them didn't. So after the war, becoming more affluent, they said, you know, my boy Johnny is going to go to college. Well, maybe Johnny wasn't really college material, but Johnny went to college anyhow because that's what mom and dad wanted him to do. So we wound up with a lot of them right after the war that all that went into the college. And of course, the great GI Bill added a lot to that, which was great. But then a lot of them wound into college that didn't need to go. But then there, there was a big influx into the school system, uh, into college areas. So with that, uh, you wonder, well, where, who's the fault of all this? <laughs> Was it Johnny after the war <laughs> being able to afford it, something he couldn't afford before? Good debate. Well, Greg, I don't see very many teenagers out there, but if I had to boil it down, just follow the golden rule. Just follow the golden rule, and you'll come out. Thank you very much. We're recording this, so maybe the teenagers will be able to see the wisdom the three of you had. So I would like to um, ask all three of you this. No, Wendell, a question for you first. And then we'll ask all three of you a question. Uh, since you had been involved with General Patton, who was a shy, retiring individual, <laughs> that's not quite correct, is that? Uh, did you have personal contact with him? And if you did, what was your personal recollections and what was the thoughts of your, your comrades, uh, your fellow soldiers uh, on General Patton, please? Well, speaking to the last point first, I don't know anybody that served under General Patton that didn't hold him in very high esteem. There's no question that he saved many, many lives 
by the action he took. Although many, particularly people in the social media, felt it was extreme at times, uh, he did what he thought was best. And it usually worked out, <coughs> excuse me, that we took many, many more prisoners than we had a thing. Now, my own personal contact with General Patton, uh, after the war, I had a cushy job uh, as aide to the commanding general of the 20th Corps, General Lewis A. Craig. He was the deputy commanding general of the Third Army. <coughs> Excuse me. And he was a wonderful person himself. And when we, General Patton was probably one of the last persons I saw in Europe. I had been in uh, London on vacation weekend. And I got back to the Third Army and was uh, told, and we were told, we were asked to come over to the Third Army headquarters the next morning. <coughs> when we got there, uh, General Craig was informed that he had been asked for back in the States to head up the 7th Service Command in Omaha, Nebraska, as a matter of fact. And General Patton said, well, uh, how soon can you go? And General Craig said, I guess tomorrow. And uh, so General Patton said, well, you take our plane here and fly from here back to Paris and then hop on that uh, excuse me. Gesundheit. Help on the plane. It'll take you right to Washington. General Patton was very condescending and wished us all well. And uh, my last thoughts of him were very, very kind. Even if he just says, talk Ohio, you could hear. Ohio, he had a very high voice that you wouldn't expect to come from that. <laughs> so, well, no, now if I could, because Donald talked a little bit about the, the returning to where you had the theater experience. I don't know that, Wendell, you've done that to any extent, or Mr. Beige, you've done that, but if you have, would all three of you just talk a little bit? The question really is prefaced by this, and I'm, rem I'm remiss in not saying this. Thank you for your service to our country. We're not done with you yet. We got a few more. We'll be able to wrap it up with a little bit of that as well. That was totally impromptu, I want you to know, gentlemen. So there's a great affection for you and all your peers. And thank you for sharing your experiences. I know that's painful in part because those recollections, just as I think those who are spiritually oriented, making confession is good, and getting it out is helpful. We appreciate that. So did you ever return, and what was the feeling you had upon returning? And Donald, you're more than welcome to amplify what you said earlier, but Wendell, we'll start with you and then move right to the three. Yes, I was fortunate in being able to take my wife uh, back to the same area. And uh, we started out at uh, Utah Beach, and it was raining, just as it had been when we were there. So a lot of this, and we followed the map that we had, and at one point, she was reading about crossing a bridge, waiting in line, and there was a bridge right ahead of us. But it was a great experience to be able to do that in a peacetime situation, and not have to wonder whether or not that gun was going to be able to concentrate on that bridge or not. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, two years ago, um, the Gener Greatest Generation Foundation invited me and uh, 11 other uh, Iwo Jima survivors, as well as from Saipan, Tinian, Guam, and Iwo Jima. And along with us came uh, 12 Ohio State students assigned one to each one of us. 
It was a wonderful experience, and I'm sure the history that was able to be relived was wonderful. And during that trip, my three crewmen, and I want to honor them, Jimmy Hark Ryder, Sammy France, and Ed Linky. I did take my time to go down to honor them on the beach, exactly at the spot that we came into. And they all three lost their lives right at that point. And I sure honored for them. Now, I don't like to leave on a sour note, so I want to give you a little story. A little boy was in the entry of the church, and he was looking up on the wall, and he seen this plaque, and he was just a staring and looking and looking and looking. And the preacher came through, and he said, little boy, what's your problem? And he said, well, he says, what's that on the wall? He said, well, that's a plaque for those who died in service. The little boy thought for a while, and he says, was that the 9.30 or the 10.30 service? <laughs> you know, we could take this on the road and we'll, we, we could really do something with this, I'll tell you. Uh, so, Mr. Bays, one more, Donald, I'd like you to comment, if you could, beyond what you said already on returning, because you took your family, and that had to be very special. I know it was, because you've told me that. It, it really was, but my remarks are way off of that right now. Well, that's okay. My mind has wandered. I'm thinking about, I, I didn't attend Ohio State University, but uh, I've really gotten to know the history department at Ohio State, and I admire them tremendously, the people I know there, uh, and even getting this thing going today, I gather this is the whole, the history department has done this, and um, it's, it's really great in the, the, their focus on military history, I think is highly appropriate, and um, the fact that all of you have come, it indicates your interest in military history. And so I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm just saying I'm impressed with all of you. Well, Donald, we're impressed with you and your colleagues. And maybe we're at the point where it'd be best to kind of mix with some folks. But before what we do, duty, honor, country. Three of you represent that very well. There was a statement that I read before coming uh, today that the greatest glory of free men is to thank, to transfer that freedom to their children. You did it. We salute you. God bless you. Is that easier? <laughs> Thank you.